Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Uh, it is now 2024, and we are off to the races uh, pretty quickly, so it would seem. We have uh, another one of our great series uh, of Lunch and Learns today. The entire focus today is going to be on what is actually covered, not, not covered losses, but the things that are actually covered under an insurance policy, how you can read it, interpret it, uh, go through all of that. This is all part of our uh, Words Matter series. So, you know, the, the entire concept of this series is breaking down a homeowner's insurance policy section by section, what's important about them, how to read, understand them. And if you haven't watched our first two uh, videos on that, I highly recommend going back to do that so that you can get the full sense because all of these sections are playing together as we're going through it. We're building on the information we learned in the prior uh, courses. So hopefully uh, you can get a chance to go back and watch them. For those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Tony DiUlio. I'm the owner and partner at Wheeler DiUlio and Barnaby, uh, where we practice in all areas of property damage litigation. Mass majority of it is first party insurance, uh, where we handle claims against insurance carriers who either underpay or fail to pay on claims. Uh, but we also do other areas of property damage litigation, construction negligence, realtor negligence, neighbor negligence, um, really all of those, those areas. What we like to tell people is if something went wrong with your property, we can probably help. Uh, so if, if you don't know me uh, and you want to reach out, talk about something, please feel free. One of the things I, I try to, to do is, is be a resource for people in this industry so that cases don't have to come to me. Uh, if you've watched any of my other talks anywhere that I've, I've spoken at either national events or on here, um, or even met me personally, I've probably told you, I don't want you to have to send me a case. Um, in a perfect world, these claims get paid by insurance carriers, and you never need to, to talk to a lawyer. That is the, the perfect uh, experience. Uh, so if I can do something to help that happen, great. I consider myself an advocate for homeowners and property owners all across this country. So their best scenario is not having to pay me. That's why I say these things. However, I also recognize that insurance companies will not always be doing the right thing. They will not always be a good neighbor and you won't always be in good hands. So if something does go wrong and you need to speak with an attorney, I'm always happy to help. Uh, regardless of where you are, I will do all I can to assist in those claims. But I am licensed in a number of states. My offices work um, pretty much in the entire East Coast, uh, in Ohio, Oklahoma, Tennessee, uh, California, um, I'm sure I'm Ohio. I don't know if I said that. There's a whole bunch. So if you need help, I can probably help you um, in one form or fashion. Just please let me know. To that end, uh, we try and get these uh, done in about an hour. Um, I'm going to do my best to, to keep on that, uh, but let's get started. One of the most important things through this process, though, is to get information right on this slide. My cell phone and my email address. Um, while I do get a ton of emails, uh, usually somewhere in the ballpark of 200 emails a day, um, I do my best to try and respond as, as quickly as I can. Text message is often the best way to reach me. Uh, that is my personal cell. You can reach out morning, day, night, uh, weekday, weekend, and I will uh, be sure to get back to you. And also because you have that number, that means you've got the absolute and full permission to bug me. If I don't happen to get back to you, it's probably because I'm on trial, I'm in a deposition, I'm doing something that I didn't, uh, I saw it and then forgot to respond. It happens to the best of us, but you have absolute and full permission to reach out to me anytime you need and bug me if I don't get back to you. So please feel free to do that. With these webinars, it is always really important that you guys feel like you have an opportunity uh, Oh, I just saw a message on here that someone cannot hear me. Are people having trouble hearing me? Um, I saw the, the one comment, but I want to make sure that people can, in fact, hear me. Um, but still no sound on Facebook for some reason. Okay. Well, if you're having trouble hearing me um, for, for one reason or another, try. We post this on both YouTube and Facebook. Um, go to the other one. That might be able to help. Uh, all right, looks like some other people can hear me. So, Mike, that might just be uh, a you thing. Um, but hopefully you're getting it worked out and all is well. So uh, where was I? With these uh, with these webinars, 
I really try to get through in an hour, but I want you to know that you can ask questions. That chat function is one of the main reasons that I do this. When I first came up with this idea a couple of years ago, it was during COVID, so I couldn't do it in person. Um, I've thought about actually bringing people in and offering CE credits if you if you do it live, you know, offering lunch. I don't know if that's something you guys would ever actually be interested in for those who are local to Philadelphia, um, but we certainly have the space and the, the capabilities. But regardless, I want the live interaction as much as humanly possible. So to the extent you guys have questions about the course or candidly anything else, put it in the chat. I will do my best uh, to make sure that I review those and um, and make sure that you guys get uh, answers to those. That's one of the, the main values that you can get from doing these is live answers uh, from me as this goes on. As I've been doing with this Words Matter series, I've been starting off with words of encouragement and um, uh, knowledge and, and quotes that I've found to be particularly interesting for one reason or another. And today we are brought one by Plato, uh, one of the great minds. Opinion is the medium between knowledge and ignorance. And the reason this one kind of hit hard for me was so often in our industry, we talk about the opinions of people, right? The opinion as to what happened to a roof from an engineer or a roofer or a public adjuster. Uh, opinions as to other causes of loss or the extent of damage. The truth is, in our industry, there is an actual right answer to everything, right? There is a fact or a truth that we are just doing our best to try and find. Either the roof was, in fact, damaged by wind or hail, or it wasn't. Either the water was occurring for 14 days or more, or it wasn't. There is a factual and truthful answer to almost every question in our industry. Opinion is often... Uh, not necessary as long as we can prove the actual facts. Uh, of course, there are going to be opinions that get brought in and, and differing sides of it, but really what you should be focusing on is that this isn't opinion. This isn't a questionable thing. It is fact, and I've proven it to you through different factors. So you really want to try and build your practice around that concept that it's not about opinion. It's just about uncovering the facts to get to the actual truthful answer. Uh, <clears throat> Last time we talked a lot about additional coverages, how they work within the policy. Uh, we gave samples and, and examples of additional coverages and things that are often missed, right? There are so many aspects of additional coverage that I see in a claim that comes to me where I say, wait, why didn't you address this thing, this you know, debris removal, code upgrade coverage, uh, ordinance and law, whatever it may be. You know, why aren't those things that are being addressed as part of your estimate and adjustment of the loss? So if you're interested uh, to go back, even if you think, you, you know, you know everything, you might know everything about additional coverage for all I know. Um, but in my opinion, no one in this industry knows everything, myself included. So there's always an opportunity to learn something. I try really hard to make sure people walk away from every lecture, um, every course with some new piece of knowledge. Even if it's one thing you get from it, it makes the whole time valuable, in my opinion. Uh, this time around, we are going to focus on those things that are actually covered. So under coverage A, under coverage B, what are the items of the structure, other structures, personal property that have coverage and what don't? When those come up, when uh, they are big issues, what you can do about them, we're going to focus on all of that. It is a course that I was hesitant to give because it feels, it felt almost like, of course, everyone knows what's covered and what's not. But as I do, every time I do these courses, I go through sample policies. And even I find something every single time I do one of these courses, I find something that I didn't realize before by reading through the policy and really breaking it down in detail. So I really recommend uh, to you and, and anyone who does mentoring or, or expands knowledge in this industry, you know, to share this type of stuff with others because uh, it's not always as obvious as you might think. So, uh, with this whole process, uh, you really want to have something in place. Every time you get a new claim, you do the same process over and over. And it's not just for reviewing these policies and, and going through these the words that do matter uh, when you're reviewing it. It's your entire process uh, for a claim should be set up in a system that is it is the same thing over and over because that is how you create efficiencies and lower your own internal costs when it is 
almost an assembly line style process for a claim. Every time you get one in, you do the same intake process, the same inspection, the same, the same steps over and over again. And you're going to realize that when you do that, you're not only becoming more efficient, you're lowering your costs and increasing your uh, own revenues and income as a result. I highly, highly recommend getting a process in place. But most importantly, perhaps, is that policy review process so that you're not uh, making misrepresentations to an insured and you're not leaving money on the table. <clears throat> so when you do go through this, you want to make the same three steps every time you are looking uh, at the policy so, so you don't miss anything. You want to look at the declaration pages first to get confirmation. If you haven't read my or watched my course, on those deck pages, go back and watch it. I'm not gonna double it up here. Then you're going to look into the base coverage form. That means you're going to look at the coverages that are available and the definitions when necessary, when there's any reference. We're gonna talk about how unbelievably necessary those definitions are when you're looking at these other sections because of how much it's referred back to. Um, but you wanna make sure you do that and look at your endorsements. Not everything is going to be in your base policy form. You need to make sure that you're looking at those endorsements as well to see if, again, there is something that is changed in the base form, added, taken out, uh, things that you might not be thinking about. As I mentioned, I really do learn something new every time that I uh, every time that I read one of these policies through with real detail. So I highly recommend that you guys do the same. All right. So as always, uh, you should always do when reviewing policies is start with the declaration page. And that matters for so many aspects. But for this course uh, in particular, it also matters. It's not just a general overview that you're looking for, but you're looking for some really specific information that's going to matter when trying to figure out what is covered and what is not covered. You know, do I have coverage for that lawn? Do I have coverage uh, for that additional structure, uh, you know, in the back? Those are all things that you start at the declaration page with, and, and here are the main reasons why. You want to be looking at the named insureds uh, first and foremost. That is going to help you define so much when it comes to personal property, uh, what could be covered and what is not covered, uh, and so many aspects of the definition section. So find out who your named insured is and find out that mailing address for them and compare it to the insured location. If the mailing address and insured location are the same, great, no real issues. If they're not the same, that's going to raise some immediate flags for me. Is this a secondary home, a vacation home? Is it a rental property, an Airbnb, something like that? All of those factors are going to change what is covered and what is not covered under the policy form. So you always want to make sure you're looking at that. That information is one of your factors towards uh, coverages that are available. Take a look at your policy period, mainly because you want to make sure you're looking at the right policy. If you've got an old policy, these things are changing way more often nowadays. So you always want to be confirming that policy period so that you can make that determination of this is the right policy I'm looking at. And the next, you're looking at the coverage list. So this is your property coverages, any endorsements, additional coverages, because it gives you a, a kind of cheat sheet to start thinking about uh, items that might not otherwise be covered. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So this, this webinar has got, there's actually a ton of information just in this concept of what's physically covered. Uh, so I'm really only going to use one policy as an example, but every policy is different. I don't know in how many courses I've said this, but they are all different. Every single one of them now, I, I really can't even think of many carriers that use a standard ISO without adjusting it in some form or fashion. So you really need to recognize the fact that all policies are different. Just because of the example I'm going to show you says one thing, it doesn't mean all policies say that. I can't stress that enough. Just because I say it in this webinar on an example policy doesn't mean it exists in all of them. So RTFP, read the effing policy or full policy, however you want to take the F, that is up to you. So uh, for the policy that we're looking at, this is a, an example from our favorite insurance company. If there was a big thing I could just pop up real fast that says sarcasm, it would say it there. Uh, but this is a State Farm policy that I'm looking at. Uh, I chose State Farm because they are the largest carrier in the country. Despite their horrible conduct, um, they, I figured it is a good place for most of us to start. 
So in taking a look at this, we can see here that there are a list of coverages and additional coverages. Like I said, this doesn't, this isn't going to give you all of the answers, but it's kind of a cheat sheet, a starting point of things that you might want to be considering in every claim, right? Is there going to be debris removal that is important for me? Is there going to be, a, for this example, a fuel release issue, you know, oil leaks into the, into the property? Are there trees, shrubs, landscaping that uh, are going to be a concern? They're just triggers. This isn't the end all be all. This isn't the only stop you need to make. It's just triggers to start getting your mind thinking about these additional areas uh, that might have coverages that you need to consider. The, the policy though continues onto the next page with forms and endorsements. Again, use these as triggers. You're gonna go back and look at them. You're gonna read them because I've told you a thousand times to read the effing policy. So I know you're gonna go check it out, but this is uh, that once uh, the first stop cheat sheet for it. Um, you can look at it and say, okay, jewelry and furs are, have special issues. Uh, ordinance and law has special issues. Backups and uh, overflows of sewers. All of these things, again, being good triggers. Um, there has uh, two questions have popped up. I'm going to start in reverse just because Jason's was, was last here in the shorter of the two. On the state farm policy, I'm wondering when they will supply, uh, simply write their policies to say denied. Oh, that wasn't actually a question. That's good. Um, that would be much easier, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. You're just denied, uh, but not actually uh, any coverage. That's funny. Uh, Mike. Speaking of debris removal, Liberty Mutual has been covering debris removal as paid when incurred. That's PWI. I think the adjusters are following a corporate mandate, but they are wrong. From reading the policy, the only time debris removal should be added as PWI, paid when incurred, is when it is over and above uh, coverage A. Is that correct? So, Mike, I would need to see that policy uh, when it comes to Liberty, but I, from memory, I don't believe Liberty Mutual has a paid when incurred provision for um, debris removal. One of the big things that you want to be looking at for all of these paid when incurred issues is if there is a specific provision in the policy that allows them to do that. Paid when incurred changes a policy. I've had a ton of fights on this and a lot of success because it actually fundamentally changes the concept of insurance. It makes it instead of an indemnity policy, it's a reimbursement policy. And in my opinion, almost every paid when incurred provision is totally BS. We've had uh, a lot of success. So if you're hitting issues with paid when incurred that it, uh, a property owner didn't know about, wasn't disclosed to them, or isn't uh, said in the policy, come talk to me. I'd be happy to take a look. So <clears throat> as I was saying, uh, with these uh, forms, options, and endorsements, you want to keep going and using those as a, a cheat sheet uh, of a starting point. Other carriers are different. They don't, you know, this, uh, I, I did a pop out here from a traveler's policy where it just says dwelling, other structures, personal property, loss of use. That doesn't give me a ton of help, uh, but it's important to see that and know that they travelers similarly had that section for other endorsements and things that um, can be looked at. But the point being just trying to drive home, all of these policies are in fact different. So let's dive into the section that we're here to talk about, right? This is uh, section one, property coverages. Almost all uh, policies, whether it be homeowners, business, or um, commercial, they generally will start off with this first section defining the things that are in fact covered, right? What, you know, what is coverage A? What does that really mean? Well, we cover the dwelling and other structures under coverage B. You know, it tells you the items not the causes of loss that comes in in the next uh, the next section under most policies. Um, so you can generally find this towards the beginning of an insurance policy. Insurance policies are wildly complex. They all vary. So it might not be in the very beginning, but it generally should be. If it's not for your particular case, I would be surprised, but it could happen. So let's take a look at this first section. Uh, and it talks about... Uh, Coverage A, which is almost always going to be the main the main structure of whatever the building is that you're covering, whether it be a home, uh, commercial property, business, whatever the case is, generally it's considered coverage A. And it starts off with this language about dwelling. It's a dwelling. We cover the dwelling and materials and supplies located on or adjacent to the residence premises for use in the construction, alteration, or repairs of the dwelling or other structures on the residence premises. Okay, so what does it all mean? 
first and foremost, we start immediately in this concept of coverage A dwelling, immediately getting into defined words within a policy. As I mentioned in some other webinars, generally speaking, when words are bolded or quoted within a policy, it means it's a defined term, and you need to go to that definition section to figure that out. Here we can see that we know the dwelling in bold uh, is covered and any materials that are used in the reconstruction um, or construction of that dwelling or other structures, all of that falls under coverage A. One of the important things to note here is that if it is a uh, material that's being used in construction, even if it's material for an other structure, it's covered under the coverage A um, dwelling portion. Don't know why they do it that way, but that's important when you're working with the limits of policies. You want to make sure that you're maximizing your limits so that you know, okay, I need to, to recognize that that building material is used in coverage A under a coverage A limit, not my other structures uh, limit under the policy. So we looked at that first, that first line and we know that it defines, has the defined term of dwelling. We have to go back to the dwelling to figure out, okay, well, it says the dwelling is covered. What does that mean? It means the building structure on the residence premises used as the, pri used as the primary private residence and includes structures attached to the dwelling. Um, okay, now they're making us go in this rabbit hole. I'm going to change my view here a little just because it looks like it's getting cut off a little bit. Um, I'm going to minimize myself. No real need to see my face. Anyway, um, so it's talking about the dwelling meaning a building structure. So they're literally using one defined term, dwelling, defined as another defined term, building structure on the residence premises. Now we've got two different defined words we got to go through. We still don't know what's actually covered because we don't have all the words in one spot to figure that out. So we go over next to the uh, building structure and we start to get even crazier with uh, where we're going. Building structure means a structure fully enclosed, fully enclosed with permanent walls and a roof. All right, so things we know gazebos are out, um, other areas, you know, a um, detached cover, you know, just a, a roofed um, a parking space, things like that don't count as part of your structure. Uh, it needs to be a permanent wall or roof. It doesn't include things like temporary roofing, like tarps, plastic sheathing, and so on. But then they go into this whole thing of, well, if you've got tarps and plastic because of a repair to the property, then it does count. Um, and it also, the building structure includes foundation, basements, crawl spaces, footings. And number five is a really interesting one that I believe is unique to State Farm. I can't think of other policies that have had it, but this is under the new State Farm policy, which is one of the reasons I used it. And it includes the gravel, stone, or sand used as fill material and located not more than 12 inches directly below the slab described in item A1. That includes the water lines, so on and so forth. So what State Farm has come in and said is, all right, your property, when it, whatever that lowest level is, the foundation um, in, in the basement floor or your uh, slab floor uh, on your property, you've got from the bottom of that slab, 12 inches down, all of that counts as your building structure. And the reason they did that, um, you know, being the lovely people at State Farm that they are, if you have a drain line that goes underneath your property and it breaks and leaks at 12 inch, at 13 inches under the property, they're going to tell you, oh, that's not the building structure anymore. Now it is passing through dirt, ground, it becomes groundwater. Um, we're not covering that. Uh, it's It becomes a, a big mess. It is not been particularly helpful for most people in this industry, but we've had a ton of fights with State Farm where they deny a drain line leak under a slab saying that it uh, is ground or surface water, really groundwater, and they don't even take into consideration this 12-inch uh, rule under their own policy. And we come in and say, prove to me it's not within those 12 inches because I've got photos of it that show it about four inches below the slab. So you prove to me, State Farm, that it's not, and they've been losing those pretty consistently. Um, the, so now we've got just to, to jump this around right now, we've got that building structures, uh, refers to, uh, a structure fully enclosed. Now we have to go back to residence premises. If you recall in the prior dwelling definition, it was a building structure on the residence premises. 
So now we know we've got a fully enclosed uh, building on the residence premises. And the residence premises means the one, two, three, or four family dwelling or other structures or and grounds. That's going to be important later. And grounds or the part of any other building structure where you reside and which is shown in the declarations. So now we are getting further and further down this rabbit hole of definitions. We still don't, we become somewhat circular in it, but we've got to figure out what dwelling is and it's gotta be a building structure on the residence premises, which means it needs to be the place where you reside. Well, what State Farm has failed to do and what almost every carrier has failed to do as far as I'm aware is to find reside. What does it mean to reside somewhere? I've got two homes. I've got a home down the shore I'm in for half the year. I've got a home in the mountains I'm in for half the year. Where do I reside? Which one? Well, you can reside at both. You can reside at multiple locations. But all of this is really important because you've got to recognize uh, when you've got one of these losses, hey, is, the, is this the place where they are residing? I've got to make sure that I can make an argument for that to get coverage for the structure because otherwise you've got a big uphill battle if the insured is not residing at the property. Uh, we've got a, a, a question here uh, or comment uh, from uh, Bill Underkoffler. Bill says, hey, they argue that if there is dirt in the immediate 12 inches, that's not covered either, even if it's less than 12 inches. Uh, they can make that argument all they want, but the policy even notes things like sand. Uh, they'd have a really hard time, in my opinion, and, and I know this actually from personal experience with Bill, who has argued these in one with some of our cases uh, in court. But even the dirt that is in that section, if, they, if you want to call it dirt, is generally considered fill. Um, because when they are doing that initial construction of the property, those 12 inches are compacted specifically for uh, the foundation to be put on top of. There's a, a construction material that goes through it. It's still fill underneath that property because it's been manipulated uh, and needs to uh, needs to be addressed accordingly. If it's not within, if it's within those 12 inches, I don't believe there's any way State Farm is ever going to be able to deny it. I don't care what material is under there, but uh, an important one. Uh, so there's a chain here and I want to make sure that I get the question right. Um, from Jason, generally when policies are covering extra 5% for debris removal, is it coverage A and coverage C paying to remove non-salvageable contents? Uh, so great question. So the additional coverage, again, read the policies and we're going to go over debris removal, um, a little bit, and I think I did it in the last course for additional coverages, but a lot of times the debris removal specifically will state that it relates to coverage A limits and as such would fall under coverage A for debris removal. If you have non-salvageable contents, I think there could certainly be an argument so long as the policy is not specific on whether or not it is debris removal for coverage A, that you could absolutely have additional coverage for debris under um, contents that are non-salvageable. I, I really like that argument. I think I never thought about it before, um, but it's uh, a really interesting, uh, really interesting premise. All right. So let's keep going here. Um, last but not least, to get to our final decision of what dwelling is, you've got to look to who you is uh, because the, again, residence requirement says where you reside. Well, who the hell is you? You and your means the person or persons shown as named insureds on the declarations. Remember how I told you it's important to go back at the very beginning and figure out who your named insureds are? Here's why. If a named insured shown on the declarations is a human being, then you and your include the spouse of the human being, a party to a civil union with the named insured domestic partner, a per person in a substantially similar legal relationship with a named insured. Um, in essence, they're trying not to mince hairs regarding relationships, but your significant other is generally going to be considered a you under the policy. Um, do note that under this policy, if such a relationship is recognized and valid in a state where at the time when the legal relationship was established, so long as the person in the above relationship resides primarily with the named insured. This could get a little hairy um, in, in particular relationships. If not recognized by the state, what does it mean to be a domestic partner or a civil union? 
Um, I can see some fights there. I haven't had to have those yet. Hopefully, I never do, but know that that is an issue. All right. So now we've got what the dwelling is, right? Super clear. Obviously, we all know exactly what the dwelling is based off of those lovely definitions. Um, but point is, it's going to be, generally speaking, the main building on the property, right? The home where someone is living, the main office where uh, a commercial property is, so on and so forth. Those are going to be what are going to be fitting. But dwelling uh, is going to be that main house. So now we've got to figure out everything else, right? What else is covered under this policy beyond just that main property? So we take a look at other structures. Other structures comes up really often. I don't know how much uh, you guys are dealing with things like detached garages, things, pools will often be coming up um, and, and some other items. So you really want to make sure you're looking at this other structures coverage to figure out what you've got um, to deal with under that particular coverage. Here, we cover other structures on the residence premises, which we already looked at a definition for separated from the dwelling by clear space structures connected to the dwelling by only a fence utility line or similar connection are considered to be other structures we do not cover other structures not permanently attached excuse me to or otherwise uh, forming a uh, part of the reality used either completely or in part in business purposes um, and they go through a lot of business purposes or areas rented or held to rental uh, unless it's rented to a person who's a tenant of the dwelling, rented, used solely in the private garage, blah, blah, blah. So long story short, you've got to make a determination of whether or not this structure, this other structure is fully uh, detached by clear space from the dwelling. We know what the dwelling has been defined as. So is there a clear space? The fact of the matter is this is an area that has been up for dispute for a number of years. You've got a finished patio. That finished patio attaches to your pool, right? So you've got your home, back door goes onto a finished patio connected directly to the house. That finished patio goes into a pool. Where does, and, and that pool uh, has a, um, a pool house that is next to it on top of that same concrete at the property. All of these items are connected, right? The concrete is connected to the house. The concrete connects to the pool. The concrete uh, connects to the um, pool house. Where does our line get drawn? Well, here's the short answer. You only need to worry about that line if you're worried about coverages or limits under the policy. Otherwise, don't really care if it's covered as a, an additional um, other structure or as the dwelling unless you've got to start working with those limits. If you've got limits issues on the policy, you're going to want to make sure you've got your primary arguments so that you're maximizing that value under the policy for the insured. So we keep going on this and we have to talk a little bit about business. And this is so important because policies have different definitions for businesses that are all uh, nuanced and need to be reviewed. This comes up a lot, and I've got a list at the end of, of you know, times that this matters, but I might as well say it now. This comes up a lot with people who had a, an old business and have brought materials from that business to their home because the business is closed, whether it was inventory. If a person was a contractor and has a ton of tools uh, at the property because they used to be a contractor and now they, uh, they've retired, you know, what happens with those items, what's covered and what's not? All of it's important because of these definitions of business. So I, I don't want to go through it word by word. The words do matter, but we just have a limited amount of time. So I wanted to put this on here so you guys had an opportunity to recognize that the business definition within a policy is important and you should be reviewing it to make sure that you're hitting on um, the, right, the right arguments for these. Um, next. We get into what an insured actually is. And the reason that's so important is because a number of these um, of these definitions under other structured relate back to insureds, uh, whether it's under the business language or otherwise, you should recognize insureds are not the same as named insureds. They are two different things. It's not you under the policy um, because you is defined as the named insured. Insureds is more expansive and it gets to you, obviously, 
your relatives, another defined term under the policy, and any other person under the age of 21 in the care of a person described above. So I own a property. I have a uh, daughter who lives at the house. She's obviously my relative. Great. My daughter has uh, is fostering a eight-year-old at the property. They are also an insured because they are under 21 and in the care of my daughter, who is a relative. All of those constitute insureds under the under the policy. Um, there's a comment here or a question from Howard. Uh, it's a little long, so it's not all going to pop up here. The State Farm policy defines issues with tarps. Yes, they do. Other policies do not. Some carriers hold that tarps are not part of the building, even those used to temporarily cover the exterior after a loss. This becomes important when dealing with a second loss, uh, which, uh, sorry, dealing with a second loss, which involves contents and a requirement for the outer shell to be opened, allowing rain, snow, or sleet to get in. There is mixed case law on the subject. Are there any recent cases addressing this? Yes, Howard, actually, one of my cases. So uh, I had just litigated a, litigated a claim uh, that resolved about a year and a half ago. Yeah, about a year and a half ago, uh, it was up. it's a Pennsylvania case. It was up in Gettysburg where it was a hotel that had this exact issue that happened. It was, it was not a covered loss that initially started uh, the claim. Uh, it was a roof construction project that was happening. They had torn off the roof and they were using uh, tarps to cover the roof uh, during a storm. Tarps blew off of the property and the uh, immense amounts of water came down into the property causing damage. There was an opinion, a really uh, great opinion from a federal judge in Pennsylvania, Judge Beetlestone, where she came out and says, look, the policy is not clear on this. The policy, and she uses the word ambiguous, is ambiguous as to what it means to be a roof. Uh, we had gotten a ton of great testimony from the defense experts who all said, well, they don't, they don't know a definition of the roof, but here's where they would go to look for the definition of the roof. And the short version is that it was always defined as the outermost covering of a property. That was kind of the general concept. And in this situation, a tarp was in fact uh, considered the roof of the property. It, it had no language about temporary or not, uh, and it was is really beneficial for the industry as a whole. I'd be happy to share that case with you. If you shoot me an email, I can send you over the opinion so that you can you can use it if necessary. Please note that it is a trial level opinion, so it's not binding, but it should be persuasive uh, for anyone in the industry that is trying to argue that point. Um, so. Uh, jumping into, uh, we, we went over what the insured means. We now uh, look at relative. It is wild how much these policies make you jump around. And they do it, in my opinion, somewhat on purpose, but because it's also, and I must recognize, it would be nearly impossible to put all of these definitions in every point and not have them referring back and forth. Um, so it is a necessary evil under these policies. But recognize that they even go as far as trying to determine what a relative is through definitions uh, within the policy. Uh, there is an important, the important one on here that I want you to note is actually at the very end. It says it's any one of these, but they also must primarily reside with you. Um, and that becomes more important because now they are talking about primary uh, residents. They don't use that terminology in other, where, uh, in other spots. They need to primarily reside with you. So if they're only with you, you know, two days a month for one reason or another, they, they don't primarily reside with you. Um, that could be an issue. Not one that is insurmountable because they, again, aren't defining reside. If I reside 50% of the time in one spot and 50% in another, aren't I primarily residing with both of you? Um, candidly, that might even be 20 and 80%. I primarily reside in both spots. One is 20% of the time, but it's still primarily somewhere I reside. All right. So we've gone through the dwelling portion uh, somewhat briefly, but with a little bit of detail into those definitions. We've gone through some other structures. Now we get into what is not covered in those, uh, in those sections, right? So when it becomes structural, what isn't covered as part of that coverage A or coverage B, other structures. And we talk about land. Land is one of the, the main reasons I wanted to do this uh, lecture because there's a lot of talk and a lot of questions we received about, you know, the grass outside and, and pipes that go through the ground and the driveway and all that kind of stuff. So it's important that we recognize land is 
generally not a covered item under these policies. Um, we don't cover costs to replace, rebuild, or uh, stabilize any land, uh, anything used to um, regarding that instability would not be covered. It has part of the not covered is trees, shrubs, live or artificial plants, right? So artificial plants now aren't covered under this policy, um, despite in my opinion, that being a, a content of the home, if it's uh, an artificial plant, but that's a whole different issue. And they note that, however, there's the exception of the additional coverages for trees, shrubs, and landscaping. But uh, last but not least is the systems and equipment using uh, electrical power. So the electrical lines um, uh, at the, the property as well that go through the ground. All of these things being property not covered, most of which have some form or fashion of an exception. Now we get ourselves into coverage B, personal property. These are the things that aren't structural to the home. Hopefully you guys all know that, but uh, these are the, you know, the tables, the chairs, that type of stuff that you're purchasing for inside a home. If it is not permanently and physically attached to the property, there's a good argument that it falls under personal property. One thing to note, if you do have limits issues under a policy, there are strong arguments that items like appliances can fall under either personal property or coverage A, uh, the structure. So just know that you can play with that a little bit when it comes to figuring out where the appropriate spot it is to be. Again, if there's no policy limits issue, you don't need to worry about that. So we look at uh, personal property, what is covered? We cover personal property owned or used by an insured while it is anywhere in the world. So that's interesting. That first sentence alone raises some questions. Okay, I can either be owning it or even just using personal property and it would be covered just at least starting with this first line. This includes structures not permanently attached to or otherwise forming a part of the realty. So wait a second. Now we know that it's got to be personal property, but it's including structures not permanently attached to the property. I don't really know what example I could think of that. Maybe a, a kid's house, like a toy house, something like that. Um, if you've got other ideas, that would be really interesting as to, to what, what else would fall under that. Um, uh, and at your request, and this is important for a later time, we will cover personal property owned by others while the property is on that part of the residence premises occupied exclusively by an insured, owned by a guest or a residence employee while the property is in any other residence uh, occupied by an insured, and owned by rumors, boarders, tenants, and other residents, uh, any of whom are related to you. So a little bit of a long list there of other people that might be covered only if you ask them, right? You don't have to cover those items, uh, but if you want to, for example, you have a friend uh, over for a party, uh, they've brought uh, some board games and the house burns down to the ground. Those board games could arguably be covered under this section. Uh, all right, so we've got a, a comment here from Tom Cipriano with a question. I've tried, mostly unsuccessfully, to argue that the sidewalk is covered property, primarily for access, as part of the building structure since they are attached to the dwelling and located on the residence premises. Am I wrong in my reasoning? So a lot of this is going to come down to the policy language, as I say about everything. But this policy, uh, let's use it as an example with State Farm. State Farm defines that dwelling as the building structure, which has four walls and a roof. So we know that the anything within the four walls and the roof are part of the building structure. But what about those things that are obviously still structure that don't fit that definition? Easiest example being uh, the deck on the property. You have a deck that is attached to your home. It doesn't have walls. It doesn't have a roof. But clearly that is still part of the building structure. What I would do, Tom, in those situations is use those obvious examples of things that no one would ever really dispute as being part of the house, right? Part of the, the home, that porch, uh, that deck clearly is part of the, the dwelling. And I don't think anyone would fight you on that to say, look, there's really no distinction here between the deck and the sidewalk. And as a result, those items are part of the dwelling. They're extensions of it. Yes, I recognize they extend beyond the four walls and the, and the, uh, the roof, but they're still part of that dwelling. And I think you'd have a good shot. I don't think your reasoning is wrong. 
It's just a matter of getting them to recognize why you are right. And just saying, oh, well, it's attached might not be enough. Give them examples of things that are attached that are, and uh, they would may hopefully make the connection of, oh, you're right. There is no real distinction between a deck and a sidewalk. So why am I covering one and not the other? Uh, Steve Nat followed up with how about the driveway uh, when it has to be dug up uh, when the sewer line breaks under the driveway. I'd make the same argument. It all comes down to that that attachment. If if there is a, a concrete patio on the back of the home that's attached from a walkout uh, a walkout slider, for example, uh, then the <coughs> excuse me that that would be covered. Why is a driveway any different? These are definitely nuanced areas, and it is the argument area for all of these, you know, what is covered and what is not. Again, the reason I wanted to do this whole course was, was really based off of things like that, sidewalks and driveways. So I want to be giving you guys the tools to, to push back. Use the language of the policy as often as you can. If the language of the policy isn't clear, use examples that clearly fit into the definitions that you know they would recognize as covered, and then go back and say there's no distinction, there's no difference between things like driveways, sidewalks, and the and the like, um, so that we get the the right outcome. Uh, there, Jason followed up on uh, on a deck that is not attached to the house, quote freestanding, if it's uh, it's off the house by a matter of a fraction of an inch, but is still freestanding. If you've got a freestanding deck that isn't secured into um, one of the uh, uh, supports of the home, there is an argument to be made, even if it's a fraction of an inch, that it would be a freestanding a, a structure not attached to the building. Um, it gets nuanced at that point, but I look, I got to be honest, I think in that scenario, if it's not physically attached, it's not physically attached. Um, there's, there's not much that we could do about uh, that situation. But I think most decks are probably attached to the home. Every All the decks that I've built are, have been at least. Um, so let's jump back into um, uh, the, the structures here. Um, oh, there is an, uh, one more thing from Mike Muma here. Uh, there was a very large freestanding playground for our kids. I poured concrete footers, bolted the playground equipment to the footers. Would that have been uh, covered by other structures due to being bolted to the concrete? Uh, I believe yes. So one of the things that they note in the uh, under this policy language for uh, personal property versus other structures, the other structure or the personal property needs to not be permanently attached, and uh, that I believe, as the result of it being bolted to the concrete, is permanently attached and could constitute uh, other structures, which would be really interesting given the different coverages available, i.e., all risk for other structures versus name peril for the. Uh, for contents. So the other area you want to check for things that are covered, or one of the other areas you want to check, is your special limits uh, section. Almost all policies have a section of items that are special limit items. And the reason being is that these items would generally fall under the definitions of um, dwelling, other structures, or personal property, but they might give you, again, a trigger to, oh, yeah, that is something that I should be considering under my losses. So we've got a, a long list here of the examples from the state farm policy of 12 items that fall within um, the special limits, but things you might not otherwise think of. And you should recognize when you have a loss for those items for whatever reason, there could be a particular limit. Please note that a number of these special limits are special to a cause of loss. What I mean by that is things like... Um, when items are stolen, it is a different, there's a special limit for it versus if the house burned to the ground. So just recognize that those uh, limits are there and that they are different within these policies. Um, I knew this would take a while, but I was hoping it wouldn't be this long. So I'm going to try and speed through a little bit on uh, a few of these. There is a long list in every policy of personal property that is not covered. And I want you to make sure that you are checking this because again, it provides you a ton of information as to what you can actually claim and limits uh, within that policy. So other items specifically insured, if you've got special insurance on things like jewelry under a separate policy for um, for someone else, that might not be covered as a result of the language within these. So make sure you're noting that. Animals, birds, or fish. What about other pets? Uh, 
right? The idea here being they've they've specified uh, animals, birds, and fish. What if there's something that doesn't fit? You know, why do they have animals and birds or fish separately? Aren't they still animals? I'm trying to think of something that wouldn't be an animal. I don't want to think about that one. Motor vehicles, unless. So there is a, a nice uh, language in here that you should be aware of about motor vehicles. Any engine propelled or motor propelled vehicle or machine, including parts designed for movement on land, except as provided. However, we do cover those vehicles or machines that are not designed for travel on public roads, not subject to motor vehicle registration, and that are used primarily to service the insured location or designed for assisting persons with disabilities. So just know that there are specific uh, restrictions and limitations when it comes to those motor vehicles. Uh, other ones not that exciting, you know, the old uh, the old face plates for vehicles that you could you could take off um, when you would get that custom CD player put in that uh, doesn't really apply a ton, I think, anymore. Aircrafts, property owned by other residents not related to you, property rented or held to rental for others unless owned by an insured. That one to this day still confuses me. Um, of course, <clears throat> first of all, I've got the optional coverage to to say that property rented by others and their personal property is covered. But they say, unless I own it, well, of course, if I own it, it would still be covered. It doesn't make any sense to me. Property rented to others away from the residence premises. Uh, radio devices and vehicles, accounting documents. This is another one that confuses me quite a bit because they don't, they don't pay you for your books, okay? But they do pay me for a blank copy of my books and all of my labor necessary to recreate those books. So doesn't that mean the books are covered? I don't know what they mean by it, but either way, recognize that with that exception in there, you do actually get paid for the labor to recreate uh, books uh, on the property. Uh, outdated media storage, things you can't go out and buy. Uh, electronic photos. In essence, you lose all of your personal photos or uh, phones, you know, pictures on your phone. You don't get covered for that and a few other um, items. So last but not least, you should be looking into the additional coverages section. This helps trigger some other areas that you might not be realizing are in fact covered. We talked about debris removal. We talked a little bit about temporary repair, but the all important trees, shrubs, and landscaping. This section of the policy should often be reviewed because they are uh, shockingly all different and you need to understand what each specific policy has. Here under the State Farm example, they will cover uh, accidental direct physical loss to trees, shrubs, live or artificial plants and lawns, artificial grass, and hardscaping on the residence premises, right? So step one, we already looked at residence premises. It's got to be on the residence premises, but it's got a specific list of perils that these items are covered for. Fire, lightning, explosion, riot, or civil commotion, aircraft, vehicles, um, vandalism, malicious mischief, or theft. So this gets into our question of... Uh, the pipes underneath the property that go outside need to be torn out. What is covered? If you've got a, uh, a drain line that is uh, being replaced as a result of a covered loss, you normally have coverage for all that access, all that fun stuff. But your trees, shrubs, and landscaping under this policy wouldn't be covered, uh, at least under this language, because it's not one of the spec specified causes of loss. I know I rushed that a little bit, but hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So uh, we've got some others that, that come up, property that's been removed. Uh, if you didn't know this stuff that is being stored offsite, um, also has coverage under the same loss, even if it gets damaged in transit. Uh, credit card fraud, refrigerated products uh, is under this additional coverages. I don't know why, because candidly, I don't see why that isn't covered normally, why that wouldn't just fall under the rest of the coverages, but so be it. And locks to rekey a property if there's a, in the event of a theft. So why does this all really matter? I told you I wanted to talk about some examples um, of situations where this matters. Far and above, the most common problem that I see when it comes to these issues are when the homes are not just being used as the home of uh, a person or a family. It means the, the home is either being partially rented, the home is being entirely rented, the person doesn't even live there anymore, um, the person's only living there once a week or once a month. Um, those are the most common situations where we have disputes over what's actually covered and what's not covered. All of these policies, um, I, broken recording, are different, so you want to make sure you're reading it. 
There's great language, for example, in the state or in the all state policy. All state gives insureds permission. It specifically says we're giving you permission to leave your property vacant and unoccupied. So you can leave that home and there's no time limit and still covered under this insurance policy. And what happened with Allstate is they they got themselves into quite a predicament because they said, well, the insured wasn't residing there uh, for two years because they were taking care of their mother and living at the mother's house. So, so sorry, it's not your residence premises. It's not covered. We came back and said, Allstate, that's bullshit. You gave them permission to leave the home vacant and unoccupied. If a home is vacant, meaning it has no stuff in it, it's unoccupied, meaning there's no people in it, clearly it is not a person's residence. You can't give them permission to do that and say they need to be living there at the same time. So as a result, this is covered. And the court agreed with us. Um, Other situations that this comes up uh, less frequently than that, but certainly frequently enough, uh, non-relative living at the property. So, you know, you've got a best friend who's uh, moved into the property. How does that play out? Repairs extending outdoors to lawns, driveways, and sidewalks. You guys have already had a lot of questions about those, and we've actually got a few uh, pre-questions on that as well to address. Vacation homes and places used for Airbnb. Properties that have been purchased but not yet moved into. This is another one that we've uh, seen surprisingly frequently. I've I've had at least a dozen of these over my career where someone bought a home but didn't move in yet and there was a loss. What happens in that situation? And a lot of it comes down to this, these definitions and these sections of the property. Um, Homes being worked on. uh, So if there's construction occurring at the property, retired business owners uh, and their inventories and hobbyists. So one, all of these things have come up in cases that we have handled and been successful on. You know, someone who is a hobby uh, car mechanic, they, they work on cars and they'll work on cars for friends. They, they, you know, they don't charge them. They, uh, they just do the work for a friend because they enjoy the work. And the friend just pays them uh, whatever the cost of the materials were. Does that constitute a business? Short answer is no, uh, but th- it's all important stuff to be recognizing as you're going through this. When you've got definitions within a policy about business items, <clears throat> they can be really, really broad. Any item that was ever in the chain of commerce for a business is uh, under some policies considered a business item. Well, that's totally bullshit because the chair I am sitting on right now was at some point used in the course of business. It was in the chain of commerce. I'm the one that purchased it, but it was in fact in the chain of commerce. Is that a business item? I mean, it's totally nonsense stuff like that that carriers try to get away with that we push back on on a daily basis. Um, all right, so next we've got, sorry, I missed my, I would make sure I was reading the comments to that we were all on the same page. Bill Underkoffer talked about a case where he was successful with some pavers that you guys can check check on. So as always, when we do these webinars, we ask for questions ahead of time so that we can address them completely. Candidly, I think people send in questions and then never end up watching the webinar, but I don't mind because if one person has a question, it's probably come up for others. And this is the one that came up over and over again. So I only put it in once, but how does the plumbing access coverage apply to exterior paved surfaces, concrete porch, concrete walk, pavers, driveways, sidewalk? So for this, It was so common of a question that I wanted to come back to examples within policies so that you guys could see how it kind of plays out potentially differently with different different carriers. So we've got the the language um, from one carrier, if if loss to covered property is caused by water or steam not otherwise excluded, we will cover the cost of tearing out and replacing any part of your dwelling defined, it's in bold, which means it's a defined term, necessary to repair the system or appliance. This does not include damage to the defective system, blah, blah, blah. We get down to dwelling. This means the single family building structure, which we looked at earlier, identified as the insured property on the policy declarations where you reside and which is principally used as a private residence. Uh, In looking at this, we go back through all of these definitions. What is uh, the dwelling? What is the building structure? The building structure are those four walls, uh, four walls with a roof, but it's also those items that are attached to it, right? They, they specifically define other structures as those things not attached, which means 
that part of that four walls and a, and a uh, roof that is the dwelling and the building structure includes the items that are physically attached to it. Uh, this goes back to that argument of if a sidewalk attaches to the front steps that attaches to the building, all of those items are connected and you should be able to make some arguments for coverage, no different than the, the, the deck, but you need it to be that attached structure. That's where you're really going to get yourself uh, into a bind. Taking a look at another one. This is a uh, tear out language. If loss to covered a property is caused by water, steam, or sewage escaping from a system or appliance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the cost you incur to tear out and replace only the particular part of the building structure necessary to gain access to the specific point. So again, we're going back to that building structure language. This is State Farm's language. I think the first one was all state language. Back to building structure. Well, uh, that was this language that we looked at before. Uh, this includes the foundations that support the structure, uh, slabs, basement walls, uh, crawl space, footings, gravel and stone, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I don't know why that that's a thing in policies. Wall-to-wall -wall carpeting is, is spelled out separately. <clears throat> um, before my time, I think. So last but not least is, is one more exception. I think this was travelers. Uh, and note in this section, the lack of defined terms, right? Those two other ones had defined terms for building structure, for dwelling. This policy doesn't have all of those defined terms and doesn't reference them. So it can play out a little differently. So unless the loss is otherwise excluded, we cover loss to property covered under A and B. Uh, resulting from overflows. This includes the cost to tear out and replace any part of a building or other structure on the residence premises, defined term because it's in quotes, but only when necessary to repair the system uh, or appliance. Uh, we do not cover the, call, the, the system itself. Uh, doesn't include the sump pump, any of the above ensuing property. So Long story short, this one only brings us back to uh, buildings or other structures on the residence premises. Well, now this becomes broader. In my opinion, this is broader than when it says, you know, those it just the, the dwelling, which is the building structure. We're going beyond that. We're adding in other structures. Uh, so now we've got, without a stronger definition for structure, which this policy doesn't have, and most policies don't for other structures, you know, we've got things like sidewalks and driveways that are structures. Those are structures. They're things, they're man-made things that are built. Um, those are structures within the property and should have coverage. So you want to be using this language to your, your, um, your uh, best ability and giving those examples of, um, you know, things that are obviously covered when there is access, um, like a deck, like I mentioned, and use that, use those analogies and those similes so that people can understand, oh, these other things are also covered as well. So here's another question. Reconstruction messed up the lawn on the backyard. What are my options? So again, you've got to go back to the policy language for lawns. See if you've got a triggering event. If it isn't, if the policy defines it like State Farm does, where it's got to be X, Y, or Z causes of loss, unless the original cause of loss uh, related to fire, for example, and, and the lawn was damaged in the course of repair, you're going to have a hard time. It, you can relate it back to the original claim and say, look, this was no different than, you know, I needed to access uh, the insulation behind the wall. So I had to tear out the, the, the drywall that's covered. Well, to do the, the roofing work, I had to uh, do scaffolding because of the slope and that damaged the lawn and the shrubs. So it's still covered. You know, that type of stuff is the, the arguments you're going to want to make. But it all goes back to the policy language. It all goes back to why these words matter. Uh, shockingly, that's why I went with the, uh, the the title of the of this um, uh, of this series. As I always say, I will address questions that have nothing to do with uh, the topic because I want to make sure everyone feels they've got an opportunity to get the answers. The next two questions, the last two questions, um, are not related to this, but I'm happy to address them. How to get a tile roof covered from hail? from language in the policy. As with any hail claim or any roof claim, you generally are going to need to show direct physical loss. Um, the hail damage to a uh, tile roof needs to be shown just as much as any other. Generally, the things that I look for when I'm looking at photographs of tile roof damage uh, for hail damage <coughs> are the areas of the breakage, right? Are they on the edges uh, of, of the tiles? 
versus up high on the tile. If it's going to be up high on the tile, you better have some pretty significant hail. Um, but you're also going to be look, looking for coloration changes. So one of the biggest things with uh, tile roofs, slate roofs, really any, even shingle roofs, is when you have an area that is broken as a result of a covered loss, those exposed areas from the break are generally going to be of a different color than the rest of the roof. It's one of the easiest things to look for to say, hey, this isn't something that has been sitting here for 10 years and that everything is blended in color. It's new. You can see it because of the differentiation in color. Um, other aspects, if things are cracked or broken, you're looking for debris well, within those cracks. Although that can happen during one storm, you can get um, dust and debris that is uh, blown up in a storm and gets in those cracks. But you also want to look for the sharpness of the edges of those breaks. The longer a break has been sitting, the smoother the, the edge uh, is going to be where that break was. So you can look at all of those things to, um, to show that it was in fact from the storm and part of the direct physical loss from that claim. And of course, last but not least, get an expert. If you don't feel like you've got enough ammunition in your background to present these points, bring in an expert in the industry that can do that. Does an insurance company once notified of a loss have a fiduciary responsibility to protect the policy owner? This is a really interesting question, not one that I ever really thought about. But so I decided to do a little bit of digging. I could not find any case law to show a fiduciary relationship between an insurance company and an insured once the claim is notified. Uh, there is case law on fiduciary duties uh, for insurance agents uh, in the event of, uh, of insuring a property, but the carrier itself, I uh, found nothing to show a fiduciary duty. It's an interesting argument though, because of the concept, does a carrier have a responsibility to try and locate additional damage to a property when insureds don't know about it or even know to look. And I think that's really why it hasn't been decided because that would that would be, while it should probably be the case that carriers have a responsibility to, to fully investigate to help an insured, um, I don't see a court uh, ever putting that responsibility on a carrier uh, to do that. So uh, I have never found that there is in fact a fiduciary duty. I really appreciate everybody <laughs> Every time I do one of these, I think that I can get through in exactly an hour and I won't feel rushed, but I feel rushed every time. So if you feel like I uh, glossed over something or you'd like more information, please reach out to me. Use me as a resource. You know, I tell people try not to just bombard me with you know silly questions, but if you're really stuck on a claim, um, you know, I'm always happy to help. But one of the first questions I'm going to ask you is always going to be, do you have the full policy and have you read it? Because if you don't have that full policy and you haven't read it, you don't need me yet because you should be able to find the answer yourself. Um, but feel free to give me a call anytime. Uh, shoot me an email. Again, you can always text as well. Um, there's a, a final question from, from Jason. On the duty to defend, is this limited to liability or does it extend to the case homeowner entered into a contract for payment uh, for a covered loss? Carrier doesn't pay. Does carrier owe for the defense? Um, homeowner entered into a contract for payment for a covered loss. I'm not sure what, the, I'm not entirely sure by what you mean, Jason, on, on this question, because if the carrier is not paying, then there is, then the carrier doesn't believe there's a covered loss. I don't know what they would be defending. Um, so we might need a, a little more on this, but if you want to shoot me a text or give me a call, you've, you've got my number. Um, can't believe it's on the screen as well, but I know you've got it. So uh, give me a call. We can we can talk more. And I apologize about my confusion. Short version, well, what I can tell you is the duty to defend is part of section two of the policy. I don't believe it's in the general conditions. I'm pretty sure it's in section two. Um, oh, I see. okay. So he says the roof gets covered, carrier pays 10K, contractor charges 15. Only question I have left then, Jason, is who's suing? Is the roofer suing the homeowner and they have a responsibility to defend for that? Uh, short version is, though, it generally falls under Section 2 of the policy, which is the liability section. I'd have to go back and double check that, but I'm relatively confident that the duty to defend falls under the liability section only. Um, but we can absolutely talk about that in further detail. Again, thank you, everybody. Um, is... Uh, for, for attending this. Hopefully you find value. If you've ever got recommendations for future um, courses, 
please let me know. I would be happy to do it. Uh, we've got a few more in this Words uh, Matter series, but last time I broke it up uh, with a, a code upgrade class that I think was was pretty helpful for people. So if you've got ideas, I'm happy to, to do those as well. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful new year. Um, really try to, to do something good for some people. Um, there's just not, a, not enough good out there. So if I could send one message, uh, do something nice for somebody else and uh, make that part of the 2024 year. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.